When they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we will say, a wild beast has devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands and restore him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal, and as they raised their eyes and looked, Behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is us, it is for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood, and they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Sometimes life is the pits, isn't it? And here we see Joseph in the pit. And history, someone said, is truth teaching by example. New Testament truths are illustrated in the Old Testament. And that's what we see here in the life of Joseph. New Testament truth illustrated in the Old Testament. For we see in Romans 8.28 this wonderful New Testament truth. We know. I like that certainty, don't you? We know. Really, it shows me that the Bible was written by way more than man. Yes, God used man, but... God supernaturally gave us this book. It speaks of many certainties. These things are written that you might know you have eternal life. And so the Bible was given to us with great certainty. And here's a certainty. We know. Take your pen and circle that word know. We know. We know that God causes some things, most things, no. God causes all things. Circle that word all. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that all things are good. We live in an evil world. And it was not good for Joseph to be thrown into the pit by his evil brothers. But God will work good out of it. And so take your pen and start with the word God. And underline this phrase, God causes all things to work together for good. Not all things are good, but God brings good even out of bad things in our lives. God causes all things to work together for good for you and me. Years later, Joseph, many years later, Joseph would say this in Genesis chapter 50. He would say to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Now Joseph could look back and he could see the hand of God. When we're going through it, when we're in the pit, we don't always see God's working. We don't always see God's hand. 
But years later, Joseph could look back and he realized that God had used him to help keep people alive, keep people from starving during the famine. And so you meant it to, to, uh, against me for evil, but God meant it for good. I want you to take your pen and I want you to underline, starting with the word you. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Isn't that something? Someone may hurt you. Someone may do you bad in life. But I want you to know, even through that, God can bring good out of it. God can bring good. Last week, we saw that uh, Joseph was proud. Joseph's trouble started when his mouth did. Joseph was... <laughs> Joseph... Uh, Brought back a bad report on his brothers. He was sort of self-appointed cop. And yet he was the youngest of all the boys. And he brought back a bad report. We saw that last week. We saw that he was a favored son. That his dad had given him a coat of many colors. And that represented position. That was usually done to the oldest son. And it was usually done to the one in charge. And it was kind of like you're the foreman, you're the one in charge of the project, and it was given to the youngest son, Joseph. That didn't set well with his brothers. He was in a, he was in a dysfunctional family. Uh, there was envy, there was strife, there was hatred. Uh, not good in this family he was in. And then uh, God had given him some dreams about his future. And he didn't specifically know what was going to happen down the road by any means. But somehow, he had a a very clear understanding, God is going to use me. God is going to use me in a significant way. And so he was very excited, but he should have kept those things to himself. But he shared them with his brothers. It didn't set well. It did not set well. And so he was careless with his tongue. And the book of Proverbs talks a lot about our tongue, our words, how careful we should be, uh, how important our words are, how they can do damage or how they can be so helpful. And, and so he was proud. And then we see in our passage today that his father sent him out to check on his brothers, send them, take some supplies to them. When they saw him coming, they said, here comes this dreamer. And they said it in a derogatory way. And they were making fun of him. They hated him. And if you can imagine it, they took him. And at first they were going to kill him. But Reuben stepped in. And it's kind of ironic that Reuben would step in because Reuben is the oldest. And uh, to me, he was suffering the most because of Joseph. He should have had the coat of many. But he stepped in. And he said, no, let's let's not kill him. And he said, let's put him in this uh, cistern, this old well. And uh, Reuben had intended to later rescue him. But uh, they stripped him of his robe. They took this multicolored robe off of him. And, and uh, you can imagine. And, of course, this represented authority. This represented he was favored. And they hated him for it. And so they took that robe off of him and... And then later they took an animal, uh, the blood of an animal, put it on the robe, took it home to their dad and said, Dad, identify this. Is this Joseph's robe? And they were deceiving their father. And so their father would not, would, uh, would not know the truth for 22 years. Not good. The pit, it's hard to be in the pit, isn't it? Today we see Joseph down in the pit, crying out to his brothers. And he has lost his favored position. He has lost his beautiful robe. He's lost lost hope. He's down in the pit. I want you to know that God can turn evil into eventual good and you might be saying today pastor carl you don't know what i'm going through or you don't know what i went through you know i've gone through divorce i've gone through i've lost a loved one in death 
I, I've, I've been through a valley. I lost my job. I lost, I, I've lost this. I've lost that. I, I, I lost my family. I, you know, wh- whatever. I, I just know this, that God can bring good out of bad. I know that. God can work in your life. And it's not fun to be in the pit. And maybe you're in the pit now or maybe you're looking back at, and you're wondering why. And you're, and, and, uh, but I want you to know that the pit is a place of learning. And we all go through it at times. We all go. And uh, I can think of times when I've been in the pit. Not fun. Not fun. Uh, several times in my life. And, and it was tough to go through. But you look back and you, and, and you see God's hand. And I remember when we, uh, when we started our church, there was five of us meeting in a, in a living room here. And, and we, were, we were so excited. I mean, God's hand had been on us in an amazing way. You know, I had several years before walked into the bookstore and just picked up a book randomly. And, and here it was by Elmer Towns. I didn't know who he was. And I didn't know the book would become a bestseller and that Elmer Towns was the foremost authority on church growth in America. And I didn't know that God would connect me with him, that I would end up teaching English at Liberty University and auditing two courses under Elmer Towns. And then went up to him one day and asked him if I could travel with him on the weekend, drive for him or something. And we would go to church after church and, 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 and just an incredible experience and, and all those things happening. And then, and then we, we came home and with a great enthusiasm we started and then we rented a, 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 a room in a, in a, a meeting room in, a, in, a, in an office building. And that first year was just so exciting. We just week by week were seeing new people come as we were getting the word out. And so many wonderful things were happening. And after a few months, Dr. Towns came and we had an organizational service. We had 19 charter members and we just cast the vision. And people were really excited about the dream. Well, then uh, we have kind of filled that place up. That was a good problem to have. So we, we, we rented a y, uh, the Y building on 6140 South Street. And, and uh, the, the Y building was actually, it was an old uh, dairy building. And uh, the city had grown out around it. And it, it had uh, block walls with brick on the outside, 18-inch walls, big, thick. And uh, it didn't have any air conditioning, but it stayed pretty cool because of the way it was built. And uh, I still remember, like, the first Sunday we were in there, I was setting up uh, metal folding chairs for the service, and my wife was back in the kitchen making Kool-Aid because she did the children's ministry. And all all of a sudden, as I was setting up those folding chairs, I heard this blood-curling scream come from the kitchen, and I dropped my chair and ran back to the kitchen thinking somebody was attacking my wife or something. And I got back there, and she was up on a chair, and she said, A mouse! A mouse! And so the next Sunday, I was setting up chairs, and I had a helper. One of the guys was helping me, and, and uh, as we were setting up the metal chairs, uh, a blood-curling screen came from the kitchen, and his eyes got real big, looked at me, and I, and I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> and he looked at me like, you don't care about your wife. You know? <laughs> I said, just a mouse. <laughs> and, and, uh, but uh, I, I, I remember one Sunday while I was preaching in the front row, a, a, a mouse went under everybody's feet, and everybody raised their feet and kind of squealed. And, and this part, you think I'm, you're going to think I'm making up, but it really happened. It really did happen. I was shaking hands after the service, and a little boy went out, and he had a shoebox. And in that shoebox, he had a mouse that he'd captured. And in those days, we visited in everybody's homes. We don't do that now. So just relax. We're not coming to your house. But we did that. And, and, and I went to that home sometime later, and that boy had that mouse in a cage. I thought, it's amazing what people get out of church, you know. <laughs> but it, it, and then we were coming up on the second year, and, 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 and it was during that time while we were in the Y building, we had a retired pastor uh, become a part of our church, and and I don't know what happened, but for some reason he kind of got, kind of went south on, on things, and and he kind of spread that around, and, and and four or five families and him they all left, 
And, and, you know, reality began to set in. You know, the launching of the ship is a gala occasion, but then you have to, you have to face the storms of the sea. And, and, and we were driving by churches that had nice facilities, and we were coming to uh, the old Y building and setting up chairs every week, and it was, and it was very, uh, very much reality setting in. And then we had some folks who, le- who left, and then it was, it, it was like, oh, my. And when you start a church, all you have is a dream, a vision. And when you begin to lose that vision and begin to lose that dream, you begin to say, oh, my, this is, <laughs> this is very serious. And, uh, and I saw it slipping away, and I, and I, and I, I didn't know what to do. And, and this went on for weeks and for months and I would spend whole nights over there in the old Y building on the exercise mats just calling out to God. I, I still remember spending a whole night out, out there on a Saturday night, going home, shave, and got ready and came over and preached, you know. And, and it just seemed like it just nothing was happening. And after this went on for some time, then, of course, you know, I, I made a decision and said, well, I guess we just need to move on. You know, this, this we must have missed it. And, and uh Got up the next morning to shave, and there on the mirror, she had taped a a verse that now is my life verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 58. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. And as my tears <laughs> mixed with my shaving cream, I said, okay, God. I was a little angry, in fact. I said, okay, God, if you want me to, I spend the rest of my life setting up folding chairs and meeting in a rented, bu- rented building. <laughs> but I think that's where God wanted me to come to. And I think, I think we were, I look back and say, why did we have to go through it? And I think maybe there was a, a tinge of pride there. You know, pride is so subtle, you don't even know it when you have it. Oftentimes, other people know it, but you don't know it. <laughs> and, and maybe we, you know, everything had gone so well. Everything had just been so exciting and so obviously the hand of God. And then, and then I think God wanted to say, you need to know you need me. If your vision isn't so great that you have to have divine intervention, it's too small. It's too small. And, 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 and. That's where we were. And this is where Joseph is. In the pit, must have divine intervention. No longer can my favored position help me. I don't have it anymore. I don't have my coat of many colors. I don't have, uh, Lord, I, all I have is to call out to you. That's all I've got. I don't know what else to, to, to do. And God is working in his life. And God will use the pit in your life. The Christian life is not hard. It is impossible. God is calling us to do that which we cannot do. And uh, I mean, love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you and and, and on and on. It's not in me. And and the Christian life is not hard. It's impossible. And you just have to get up every morning and you have to sit down or or kneel down or whatever you do with your Bible and you have to say, God, I can't do this. I can't do this, God. And when you realize you can't do it, then God begins to work in your life. But as long as you think you can do it, God's going to leave you in the pit. <laughs> God's going to let you figure it out. And you're going you're to just get what you can get in your own strength and your own power. But God wants to work through you. And the pit is a place of learning. It's not a fun place. But God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. That's his method. And he will equip you. He will work through you. And everything in your past is a preparation for something in your future. Pastor Carl, I don't know why this happened to me. I don't know exactly why it happened either, but I know God will use it. I know God is working in your life because all things, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. 
And he has a purpose for your life, just like he had a purpose for Joseph's life. It may be a different, in a different perspective, in a different way. But we are not born with character. Character must be learned. And God teaches us through the school of hard knocks. <laughs> and he lets us sometimes experience things that we call the pits. You know, I'm in the pit. You know, two ways we learn. One is to humble ourselves, to humble ourselves. And the Bible exhorts us to humble ourselves. James 4.10, he says, we are to humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord. 1 Peter 5.6, he says the same thing. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. And so we humble ourselves or we let God humble us. And if I don't humble myself, God will do it. God has a way of working. When God gives a vision, he makes a provision. He makes the provision. He provides. And he is calling you and me to things that are beyond you and me. And so he has to work in our lives, and that's what the pit is all about. God can turn intended evil into eventual good. That's what he does. And you might be saying, I, 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 Pastor Carl, I'm in the pit. I don't see any good coming out of it. I don't trust him. And you may not see it right now. It may take years, as it did in Joseph's life, to look back and say, you met evil, God met good. And you may not see God's hand, but God uses even the evil. God brings good. The second thought here is during pit time, it's very easy to get discouraged. Going through the pit time is hard. And the enemy will make distractions and accusations he will say to you, you will never do anything for God. You always mess up. He is the accuser of the brethren, according to Revelation. The enemy will make accusations. That's what he does. The enemy of your life and my life will come and whisper in your ear. He will try to discourage you. The enemy will also try to get to you to focus on the circumstances rather than the faithfulness of God and God's promises. This is what I've lost. I lost my robe of many colors. I lost my position. I lost this. I lost my job. Or I lost my marriage. Or I lost, I've lost my health. We, 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 we lose and, and we just focus on what we've lost rather than on God's faithfulness. And the enemy will try to get you to focus on the loss to focus on the circumstances which are probably not very good. And he will tell you what a mess you've made of your life and what a loss you are suffering. The enemy will also try to deceive you. He is a deceiver. He will come to you and he will tell you lies. Your marriage will never work. You will never amount to anything for God. You will never make an impact for God. And he will whisper lies, and he will arrange circumstances to deceive you. These brothers took Joseph's multicolored coat home to their daddy with an animal's blood on it and deceived their father. And for 22 years, he mourned the loss of his son and believed a lie. 22 years later, he finds out Joseph is alive. When we focus on the circumstances and we listen to the enemy, sometimes we believe a lie. And then the enemy will deceive you. God can take intended evil and bring about good. But during the pet time, it's, it's easy to get discouraged. Here's a third thought. Remember, God is all about restoration. Restoration. Well, I've lost this in my life, Pastor Carl. I've lost this, and I've lost 
You don't know what I'm going through. God is about restoration. He is. And in fact, he will restore Joseph's coat of many colors. He will restore it a hundredfold in Joseph's life. Did you know that? Before this story is over, he will restore Joseph's loss manyfold. God is about restoration. And the purpose of the pit is to get us to call on God. That's one of the greatest purpose of the pit. Why am I going through this? It is to get you to call on God. I don't know how to put it into words, but I know this. Something happened to Joseph in that pit. Because as I read the life of Joseph, before Joseph, yeah. He was a 17-year-old proud young man. But as we read on, Joseph is a different man. I mean, in spite of the circumstances, Joseph is a different man. This is a, the presence of God is in his life in a different way as I read it. We looked at it just briefly last week. The Lord was with Joseph when he was a slave in Potiphar's house. The Lord was with Joseph when he was tempted by Potiphar, uh, Potiphar's wife. The Lord was with Joseph when he was cast into prison. And I mean, this is amazing. Joseph learned something. It is absolutely amazing. Something happened to Joseph. I remember talking to a man who went through the pit he went through a battle with cancer. And what he told me, I'll never forget. He said, I wouldn't want to go through that again for anything. He said, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It was terrible. But then he said this, but I wouldn't take anything for what I got for going through that battle. He got something. He got something he didn't have before he went through that pit. He got something. And I want you to know, Joseph got something down in that pit. And this is what pits are all about. It is to teach you and me to call on God, to get a hold of God in a way we've never known him before, to see his hand in our life in a way we've never known before, to learn a new humility that I didn't know before. I actually had a verse that I ran, went over a while ago, but at age 30, Joseph is called for by the king, Pharaoh. I mean, the most powerful man in the world. And Joseph has been in prison, and he needs Je Pharaoh's help to get him out of prison. And he stands before Pharaoh, and sa Pharaoh says, I understand you can interpret dreams. <laughs> and Joseph said, no problem. I'm really good at this. I can handle it. No, that's not what he said at all. Joseph said, it is not in me. Wow. It is not in me. And then maybe he pointed to heaven and he said, God, God will give you the interpretation of your dream. And God did. You see, God could use Joseph. Because it wasn't about Joseph anymore. It was about God. That's what God's trying to do in my life. That's what God's trying to do in your life. It's so easy to be all about me and my success and my well-being and my life and my happiness. And, and it's all about me. But something happened to Joseph in that pit. I know it's so because God can't use a proud person. He just can't. I found this this week. I wanted to share it with you. Hundred, hundred years ago, Booker T. Washington was perhaps the most famous black man on the planet. He once shared a spot of tea with the Queen of England. He was also the first black man invited to dine 
with the president at the White House. To a very extraordinary degree, said President Teddy Roosevelt, he combined humility and dignity. Then Roosevelt paid him perhaps the highest compliment any person can be paid. As much as any, uh, as much as any I've ever met, he lived up to Micah's verse. Here's the verse. What more does the Lord require of you than to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God? He said Booker T. Washington lived up to that verse. That's high praise from the President of the United States. On March 12, 1911, Booker T. Washington was in Des Moines, Iowa, delivering several sermons and speeches on the same day. He spoke to standing room only crowds at St. Paul Episcopal Church, Plymouth Church, Foster's Opera House, and a gathering of four African American churches. Booker T. was the talk of the town. Later that day, Washington was in the lobby of the hotel where he was staying when a white woman mistook him for hotel staff. She asked him for a glass of water. Instead of correcting her or identifying himself, he obliged. He got her a glass of water, handed it to her, and asked, is there anything else I can get for you? That one encounter encapsulates his character. Booker T. Washington was an advisor to presidents, but more important, he was a humble servant. So was Joseph. He learned servanthood before he was given a position of leadership. There's a purpose to the pit. God is working. Let me just say in closing that Joseph is a type of Jesus. All through the Old Testament, we see Jesus. I mean, he's on page after page after page, if you look for him. He is a picture of Jesus. First of all, they were both betrayed by Judas. It's the same name. In the Greek, it's Judas. In the Old Testament, it's Judah. But we see it in Matthew 26. Judas said to his brothers, Judah was betraying betraying him, and Judah said to his brothers, let us sell him. Then they were both stripped of their robe. We see it in Matthew 27. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, crucified him, and then they gambled for his robe. They were both sold. They were both sold. We see it in Matthew 26 that our Lord was sold as well as, as, well as uh, Joseph. And our Lord sold for 30 pieces and Joseph for 20. They were both in the pit. Jesus in the grave for three days. Joseph in the pit. We're not sure just how long. And then one more thought. Joseph came up out of that pit. He was brought up out of that pit. And the amazing thing is Joseph became Savior to the world. For a worldwide famine was coming. And God was going to use Joseph to provide for the world. And especially for his family, Israel. He was the Savior. Now, the good news is this. Those are the parallels, but the difference is this. Joseph wasn't perfect. He was a sinner just like you and me. And yes, it was evil that his brothers put him in the pit, but maybe that he had a little part in it, in his pride. But I want to tell you this. The good news is Jesus went to the pit, went to the grave, not because of his own sin. He did not sin. He went to the pit for us. He went to the pit for my sin. He went to the pit for your sin. Isn't that amazing?
Isn't that awesome? And thus, he is our Savior. And I hope you know him today. Corey Ten Boom said this, there is no pit that God's love is not deeper still. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We are waiting on God in prayer. I don't know what your situation is today. Maybe you're saying to me, Pastor Carl, I'm really in the pit. I am going through it. I want to encourage you today. And I want to say to you that one actually did go to the pit. Not just Joseph, but Jesus. He went to the pit for your sins. You can know him, and you can know you have eternal life. And God is here to encourage you today, for we know that he is even using evil to bring about good. Would you talk to him in your heart? Thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you that you work in our hearts and in our lives and that you love us so much. We thank you for the gift of eternal life. How I pray that everyone here today would know Jesus as their Savior. And we thank you that you work in our lives even after we come to know you. Shaping us, helping us, just as you did in Joseph's life. Lord, we do not enjoy the pit, but we thank you for it. And we thank you for teaching us things that only you could. And we rejoice in you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.